we have just been informed again that the administration has uh, decided that this uh, gathering is uh, creating communal hatred and breaking uh, up society. Uh, we would just like to inform everyone that uh, the permission for today's talk, first we had tried to organize it in Lohit Hostel, the mess, and uh, we did the necessary formalities, fill the form for booking the mess. Uh, the senior warden himself signed the form, we have a copy of that form with us, and he assured us that it would be forwarded to the provost and the dean of students as is the procedure. Back then also we asked that should we personally go and hand it over, he insisted that through his office it will be done. Today morning, the hostel president receives a call that uh, the dean of students has decided that uh, uh, the situation in Manipur is a burning issue and we should not be discussing that in the hostel. So we approached the provost again, uh, told him how we had started the formalities on Monday itself and there was nothing, a uh, violation of procedure happening and we wanted to have a peaceful discussion. Uh, but again, we were told that burning issues have no place to be discussed in the university spaces, which is precisely our question. We want to ask the administration that if burning issues of our time cannot be resolved peacefully by talking to each other and understanding each other, then how will they be resolved? So, first of all, we condemn the anti-democratic diktat that the JNU registrar has issued at uh, around one hour before the program saying that gathering in Ganga Dhaba has been organized without the necessary permission. To inform everyone, we have been having programs in Ganga Dhaba, Sabarmati Dhaba, Godavari Dhaba, and any open space in JNU apart from Sabarmati Lawn does not need any approval from any authority. There is no form that has to be filled or submitted. So there is no question of appropriate permission not having been taken. So exercising our democratic rights, we are here assembling peacefully and we will have this conversation whatever cost it entails and uh, that is why particularly uh, revolutionary greetings to everyone who has come in such large numbers to make this talk happen. This would not have been possible if everyone had not shown this. And particularly our speakers as well who agreed to uh, join us today. So without any more uh, uh, interruption, now I'll uh, hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Prem Hidam. Uh, he is a, a professor at the School of Law, Governance and Citizenship in Ambedkar University, Delhi. Uh, students of Delhi University, political science, I'm sure many students over here will uh, know and love all the years that he had dedicated to DU, before which uh, now he had to shift to AOD. Uh, and I think so many people coming is a testament to that. Uh, so, uh, we will ask... Uh, Dr. Uh, Prem to uh, address all of us and today's discussion is not as representatives of different communities talking to each other. I think we need to discover a language of talking to each other beyond uh, this language that the state has given us and that the state is imposing on us to keep us divided and fighting amongst each other and uh, with that I would like Dr. Prem to take over the discussion. Since it is hastily written, there might be some mistakes, and I would like to uh, um, regret uh, oh, I could have done something better. All right. Uh, the way I understand what is happening today in Manipur, and this will happen again in the near future, this is endless regeneration of the same thing. We might have done something today to restore peace, but it will come back again in, in the matters of months or, you know, few years, because we are all stuck, right? And uh, my concern is, since we are in the university, for the future generation, we need to abolish, we need to evade, we need to escape from those categories which have been largely mobilized to, to, to create this kind of a situation. And it, it is happening everywhere. So one of the concerns that I have to share with you about what is happening today in Manipur is the crisis of community. So I have uh, some four or five pointers that I want to share uh, on why I think there is a crisis in, or a crisis of community. 
And uh, I do not also consider that this crisis of community is only confined to what is happening in Manipur. This is not only about ethnic uh, uh, understanding or ethnic practice of, uh, of, of community. It also applies to what we generally understand, you know, in political language, uh, both in anthropological and sociological sense as well, that the community that we talk about uh, is in deep crisis in the context of the emergence of new forms of capital, uh, which has been plundering all kinds of resources available on the earth. So uh, my first kind of intervention into the way how things are happening back there uh, will be highlighted in the context of something which is going to happen very soon, okay? And I want to alert myself and all of you also, uh, 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 because especially in Manipur, none of the communities, you know, the Kukis, Nagas, and the Pangas, and, and, and the Maitais, we have not developed any strategy of defending the community as they are defending now uh, in the wake of some kind of a corporate plundering, which is going to happen soon. So everybody talks about identity, everybody talks about, you know, cultural core, cultural property of community, but then what if that proper cultural essence has been transformed into property and the corporates are now coming to sell it, to force people to sell it and buy it, then your sense of community that you glorify so much has nothing to give back to you. All right. So we need to develop more strategies about how to defend community out of this crisis in the wake of this corporate plundering, which is going to happen in the northeastern part because this is a burgeoning territory. A lot of resources are there in the hills, in the plain, in the, in the forest, and they are eyeing on it, right? So then I don't understand why so many people talking on the TV, the radio, and the, circu and the media circulations, they never talk about why this resource question has never been addressed. People talk about identity, people talk about disagreement, people talk about anger and rage, uh, but something is seriously missing, which is the question of resource in the, in, in, in the, in the uh, mainstream construction of a sense of community. Uh, that is what I understand as the crisis of community in, 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 in you know, many parts of this country. So let me just read it out, and there are some interesting sections also uh, <laughs> regarding the university system and especially your research. Uh, our community consciousness is deeply influenced by what we may call status identity consciousness. Consciousness is something that exists in the head of a person or consciousness as only the view the subject has of herself in relation to the world from which it derives its view. We look at the state for its provisions, for its protection. Our consciousness is thus formed only in relation to what the state can do for our welfare. This view is limited in the sense that consciousness can be more than what the state can do to protect community. Community also gets killed. It is happening. We may consider consciousness also as an ability to decipher particular relations between domination and subordination, especially in the cultural economy where this ability to decipher is kept hidden. Both the communities in conflict today are inspired by status identity consciousness. We will fail together due to our blindness to what is coming. New rating system of environmental impact assessment recently given by the Ministry of Environment, especially new system of environmental clearance opportunities cannot be whisked away from the current turmoil in the, in the state of Manipur. Hills are seen as resources. Lands, water, and minerals under the ground are envy for everybody. Neoliberal corporates are eyeing on them. People know it, especially those who are considered as leaders of the both communities know about it. Their network knows about it. This land is purely a land of jewels. We fight for the jewels. Today, we fight against one another to protect or to get a share of the land mass of resources. But soon, when corporate plundering starts, who will fight whom? From land is an identity, 
to lay in his property will be gradually imprinted on the minds of hill dwellers. The plain dwellers are the carriers of corporate juggernaut. But then there is another layer to the issue of the coming future. All communities will be corporate friendly. They will fight more to become who is more committed to corporate fidelity. In no district in Andaman and Nicoba is facing corporate plunder. If you read Michael John Wittgen's Seeing Raid, we see that land speculators convince Anisave people to buy back their land at an inflated price to protect themselves from corporate white settlers. While we know that Standing Rock protests against Dakota Access Pipeline, DAPL, stretching 1,172 miles from the back back in oil fields in North Dakota through South Dakota and Iowa to Illinois. The dollar million, a billion, four billion project was planned to carry a daily load of up to 570,000 barrels of crude oil through fracking. Canada's Idle No More INM started in 2013, mobilized indigenous people to fight for their survival against impending plunder. Recently, on 2nd May 2023, NIA raided the house of Damodar Churi, who had been working with villages against corporate plunder in several places in Charkin, corporate loot in Karnataka under today's Orisha is impossible without those who exercise political power. Kalinanangar, Narayan Patna, and Vedanta's land grave in the Niamgiri Hills is another example. People are fighting back to protect their land. Where is the people's narrative of development, a critique of corporate state development model in Manipur? This is my question. Everybody is fighting against the corporate world to save their sovereignty over the land. But this narrative is completely absent in Manipur because the corporate plunder has not taken place. But it is going to take place. The question is, are we ready to fight back? Our, our sense of community that we glorify so much today will help us to fight against the plunder. It won't happen. So I want to kind of a question, um, why am so much so fussy about this, this community consciousness? People are actually killing one another, you know, and that is how we are uh, trapped. You know, I, I don't have much more to explain this. Anyway, I'll continue reading. Where is the people's narrative of development, a critique of corporate state development model in Manipur? Why don't we see it? Because we want it. We are hungry for it. All autonomy movement in this part, northeastern part of India, is driven by a quest for development, as a book of the same title suggested. The book was edited by my friends who are well placed in the intellectual network of academic hierarchy in Manipur. We do not have this narrative as the corporate have not yet arrived. When it does, which will happen in very near future, will the conflicting communities be able to defend themselves? They will not because their leaders are eyeing on it. Identity is now property, will be property soon. This violence is ground clearing stage for the corporate to arrive. This recent killing that happened is a welcome nod to the corporate plunder. Everybody is happy about it. So I see this killing from a different perspective where there is no identity, but identity transforming itself into a property. And that is what actually drives people to kill, to distribute, to protect their land in the form of resources. Uh, the next section is something that I can share with you about how to understand community uh, from uh, by keeping away ourselves from the, the mainstream uh, method of, of, of experiencing and practicing the community identity. I uh, title this section as Proximity and Openness. Community is built around claims to reside in a territory. In fact, this is not only about claims and period of residence living in a territorial tract as many people are doing in both valley and hills. 
What we really change is not the identity of the community, but the very process of territorialization that constructs ways of living, feeling, working and thinking in relation to non-human entities like land and resources, more specifically, a formation of identity in relation to the human living in another cultural and economic territory. It harvests distance in place of the proximity that both humans and non-humans share together in the symbolic, physical, and natural organization of material relations between both categories. The idea of community that we harbor displaces exteriority as outsider, polluting forces, thus shutting down all possibilities of openness. Here, openness is not merely an, an contingent affair that just happens to us, but the volition a readiness to be curious, experimentative, and transformational capability. Distance and closer kill all formations that we all experience in daily life that occurs only in proximity and openness. Liberal communitarian self is a burden to carry since it canonized the rules of subjugation in the service of the just organization of community as a cultural practice essence and cultural proper of each community will not be able to resist corporate contamination. However, let us note that corporate neoliberalism will not protect the cultural proper. What it will do is to transform the proper into property. This will be the biggest challenge of any fanatic defense of the proper as we have already weakened the capability to regenerate culture as an alternative way of the life different from the one which corporate will introduce as the only way to protect the proper and their strategies share it. And the next section is date of community in its fascistic life. We grieve for our own. We rejoice at the date of others. This grief division and internally conflictual emotional cleavage and ideological bifurcation of what belongs to the body into the property of a thought circulation does not does a fatal disservice to an effective life of community. A disturbed effect only gets itself replaced by a stronger one of an opposite attribute. Grief for loved ones cannot be performed. Hatred of these memories and the people behind the cause of the dead of loved ones cannot be even hated, for they also lose the loved ones. Instead of giving form to a new effective solidarity, this riot has created a destructive cleavage in the psychic life of community. You cannot love, you cannot hate, you cannot grieve, you cannot hope. It is suicidal as you are drifted farther and farther from any proximity and outsiders. That is where you become fascist, trying to dictate the community to be in what you perceive to be the only way to reveal your life. All individual faculties are sacrificed at the altar of a fictive community as you wish. It will not last long as it is based on a fascistic qualities. You will not listen anymore, not to even the dead fellow beings in this quagmire date of the community lives in the fictive strength we live in a terrible life of the oldest things we have done. This section, the next section is especially about our research and our life in the university. <coughs> I am thinking to develop it further uh, because some of the categories that we use in our research in the academic thinking, in academic writing and reading, academic works in the university is deeply implicated in the production, reproduction of this sense of state identity, identity consciousness. So what is the relation between your innocent looking research method and the reproduction of the method into a violent kind of a brutality in the name of community? Now, what is the kind of connection that we can detect? And I'm, 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 I'm really alarmed because I have seen it. So I want to say this. This is something that I'm very close to, you know, this is very something very close to my heart. 
So I would like to share this with you since you all are doing research and you know doing your academic jobs and well. Uh, clarity is oppressive methods of distinction because your supervisor will tell you there is lack of clarity in your project. University is built on the notion of clear thinking, clear headedness, and the notion of clarity. And why is this clarity so harmful to us? That's what I'm, I'm thinking and you know, giving some time to, to develop it further. Uh, let me just read it out and you know, we can have more kind of work exchange after this. Clarity is oppressive methods of distinction. University is a temple of clarity. You need a clear thinking and a clear plan to conduct your research. You teach and learn and read and write. You have a clear thought. To have a clear thought, to have a clear thought gets praises and recognition. But how is the clarity so oppressive and extractive? We usually think to be clear headed is an ability to distinguish, compare, and filter what is worth thinking, what is coherent and logical. This is a method of cognitive power to distinguish two things in either causal or correlative relations. Clarity also works as a principle of methodological exercise of mastery over the material forces of our thinking. Clarity defines what belongs to what. It is a method that imposes your will onto the flows of things, both visible and immaterial, to the contrary of our usual claims of objectivity. Clarity is a cruel exercise of power over your data, your field subjects, and your own subjective consciousness. Clarity is a method of repressing intuition, a method that allows it to succumb to the demands of its own erratic assertion. Clarity is not rational as it subjugates thought to the bureaucratic vision of the academia. The academic method is an extremely torturous, atrocious exercise of power to oppress multiplicity of life affirmation that we all have. It destroys feelings of reason to reason the felt. And I repeat this line because I love this line. <coughs> Clarity destroys feeling of reason to reason the felt. The oppressive method called clarity spreads wide across the university and the universe of the state. Bureaucracy, policing, law court, criminal jurisprudence, power is clarity. Power needs to see things clearly. It dies in smoky, fuzzy environment. Clarity is a political domination of life itself under the rule of a religious examination. Community clears boundaries to make it clear. Community consciousness adopts a method of purification of territory in all its spatial forms. However, clarity can be understood as effective capability to connect a category to another, to see a flow of the chaos, a vision of pattern. Clarity is a quality presented to the ob observer by the process of becoming part of observation. It is a visual intellect, an olfactory imprint of tactile encounter. Clarity is connection, not distinction. To question the dying community and to invent new community based on proximity and openness, we need to question the bureaucratic vision that the university exercises in the form of a method called clarity. It is just one of the elements that connects to a whole series. We need to move out of the clear as we move to a new clarity of flat, surface, and creation. Crisis of community reflects the work of the oppressive method of clear visualization promoted in the universities. Change your research methodologies. Uh, the next is challenge of enumerative rationality. We want more autonomy. And we believe that this is what we need to do at the moment when everybody is doing. This explains why we need to be strong and we will need more armed brigades to aid way to our demands that we expect government has to help us get them realized. We are democratic because we are all autonomous. I kind of coined this term, this is an experiment. Uh, we are democratic because we are all autonomous. 
we need no more critique for all we need is more autonomy to be emancipated from all forms of critique and engagement we are because the state is and we demand therefore we are autonomous social antagonism never rise to transforming itself into a democratic opening possibilities of engagement with the government and highest higher echelon the elites of the much mythicized defied and yet severely minified and devalidated domain called community. If Ranavir Samadar believes in autonomy as a new political region of democracy in our age, he is incorrigibly misled to his belief that you are governmentalized and that is all. He will not interest in who makes it sure that I am governmentalized to be governed and to be assent. In the process of expansion of policy discourse, that will allow me to get involved in the dirty business of governmentalization. And there are a few things that I want to add here in this section. Everybody now seems to be talking, and they, they fall in love with the question of autonomy. Everybody wants to be autonomous. And there are a lot of critical theories on the question of autonomy. But look, autonomy is never from governmentalization. So what if we keep on inflating the power of the enumerative nationality of the state uh, by claiming more autonomy and more autonomy. Uh, the question that I can raise and think about at the moment is how do we understand autonomy away from the enumerative nationality that thrives, that feeds on a notion of autonomy, which is seriously lacking in Indian. Everybody, every community talks about the autonomy. They want autonomy. They want constitutional provision. They want funds in the central government and as a result, they have to heal. What is the way out? Uh, this is, I don't know, this is, I, I have not developed it, and there are a lot of things that I have to think about, but uh, for the moment, uh, I understand the way out in two phrases. One is sharing the outside and distribution of the inside. I think this is the way out. So what are these things that I have in mind about this sharing the outside and distribution of the inside? We do not want sharing what is already here with us. We want to share to create what we can share. We share what is outside ourselves. We share contingencies. We do not console ourselves as familial, singular entities, like we are brothers and sisters. We don't say that. This is not sharing of outside. We share the vision of what is coming to destroy everything. We share traumatic memories of our future generation. We share our date. We share not what we have to protect, but things we cannot protect anymore. We share our pain to fight despair together, for it is only way to fight fascists, the premisism of the Nita community and the vicious melancholia of the cookies. To share outside is revealing together what we can change. Sharing of the outside keeps neoliberal corporates at bay. Community is real and we must accept its reality, especially in non-Western trajectory of modernity. Let us stand for community, let us make it stronger let us not be afraid of antagonism. Let it happen. Hope lies there. This will be the best tool to redesign a new strength of the common for greater quality of transformation, revolution, or resistance. Let a government does what it likes. Let a community fight the capital. Until we build and rebuild our communities to fight this corporate intrusion, and the dreams of taking a pie out of the capitalist seduction, we will keep fighting one another. Capital does not lie at afar. It is an allurement. It is in the heads of those who talk about community, sharing bed with a corporate allurement. Resources from the forest, from the hills, need to be rethought as not resources to be extracted but to protect them, because protecting them is a protecting our community life. We are wrong and wrongly pursue the game, thinking our land is a resource all this time. Just see who talk of heels, 
plains and forests, underground minerals and water resources of our future. You can catch them easily. They are one who will create clarity as a method of killing the royal road to self-annihilation. They mobilize distinction, not connection. We do not distribute land. We do distribute words to protect land. For land is not property. It is a piece of cosmo that we use to survive. Distribution of land is possible only under the condition dictating that it should be changed into property, collective or individual. We do not distribute identity. We distribute our resistance to despair created by the empire of domination that we choose in many forms inside and outside of our own community. Distribution of insight is an anti-fascist preparation for fascism will always mobilize the proper to belong and to be. This is what I have.